Good morning and welcome to the morning show. Good morning. Finally, good to see you in person, yes, Ariel. good to see you in person. My big brother, <laughs> Ruben, and... Um, good to see you. Always. Well, thank you and welcome... Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Dr. Ayongo Iziri. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, quickly. This morning, we've been talking about Nigerian problems. The electricity sector, the education sector. Both of you are experts in the uh, health sector. And you've had experience in other jurisdictions in North America. Now, the Association of Public Health Physicians in Nigeria, that association is saying public health in Nigeria is in danger. And we all can see it, you know. Uh, all the health facilities in many parts of the country are not functioning. From your experience, from what you have seen, what do you think should be the main priorities of the Tinubu administration? What do we need to do from insurance to infrastructure to service delivery? Let's hear from uh, Professor Anyogu Izeri. Prof? You have, you have elevated that to Prof? Okay. <laughs> She's a doctor. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, well. <laughs> but Prof, okay. go on. Yeah. Show your Prof. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, everyone, and I'm happy to be here. Um, you know, in line with what uh, Professor Ogumba was saying, I think one of the things that we really need to look at that would help us in general in the country is understanding the interface between preventative health care and the workforce development. When we talk about preventative health care, yes, primary care is key, but the truth of wellness is actually prevention, meaning what can be done and what should be done prior to the actual illness content. So that would include healthy behaviors, um, early detection, preventative screening, screenings for hypertension, diabetes, screening for cancer, screening for mental disease. As much as we don't naturally consider this as a primary cause, mental disease is a huge burden and actually could complicate your ability to care for other um, illness milieus. Preventative health care requires, however, the ability for us to have a level of health literacy that allows you to understand how to best deploy treatment when it's given, how to impact on what you can do within your daily routine, how you need to watch what you eat, educate yourself, um, have healthy practices, keep your BMI in check. These are all things that require you to have a level of health literacy that requires a development that requires also not just the government, but everyone within the circle of influence to have an understanding to be able to impact. Um, people who are educated live longer. Studies have shown that. The education may require um, that you are able to defer instant gratification and understand the public health tenants that require you to prevent disease. If you look on the top five, three or five causes of death in Nigeria from 2019 in Statistica, aside from neonatal diseases, the one common and black, um, prevalent cause of death is malaria. And I think all of us regard malaria as something that we have to live with. But can you imagine a world where malaria is no longer present, where it's been eradicated? Some studies have indicated that over a billion dollars a year, a month, is spent on direct costs from malaria. Now, if that money was taken away from the direct cost for malaria, and this does not include the indirect costs that include loss of wages, affecting the workforce, um, um, uh, illness in the family, failure to thrive, and so on and so forth, all of that could then be put into other infrastructure and or therapies that would be able to improve health in general. Malaria, malaria has been eradicated in the past in other countries. Nigeria um, represents almost 30% of the global burden of malaria. That's a huge degree. Now, when you talk about sustainable health um, uh, health um, care frameworks, it would include a situation where you have the adequate therapies, um, research development, the ability to utilize in innovation to attack, address the life cycle of the parasite and its environment to then equate to and actualize eradication. These are all things that are involved in when we talk about innovation and therapies. It's not, it doesn't have to be that far-fetched. We're not talking about going to the moon. We're talking about things that are able and currently residing in other areas that could 
possibly improve the healthcare delivery space to decrease the burden and the need for the lack of the workforce that's present. I say the lack of workforce because we all know that from WHO statistics, there's not enough providers, and I say providers loosely because it's not just physicians, right. members of the team that could be able to take care of the population at risk. So what do we do? Nigeria has a wonderful, highly trained university physician producing net, uh, network. I say that, I was trained in Nigeria. I think it's one of the best places that you could be educated. Um, but it's not enough because there's a lot of people that require the care. And even if you wanted to train as many physicians for you to be able to manage the, net, the population, you need team members, you need allied, you need nurses, you need technicians, you need multidisciplinary approach and collaboration to be able to make this effective. Very insightful. Thank you so much um, to you both for just drawing that line. Um, Professor Gumba, you center on primary health care, and I think that's absolutely spot on because for any nation's health care to thrive, you must have a solid primary health care delivery system. Now, you talk about funding when you were speaking, and if you look at the budget for this year under this administration, less than 5% of the budget is, has gone into health care, and that is for the entire, whether primary, middle level, or tertiary. How would you go about or suggest or recommend to maximize, despite the fact that we don't have a huge amount of money allocated in terms of the needs of the nation, how would you advise in terms of priority spending? What must be the immediate things to be addressed, especially in the area of public health um, and primary health care delivery? So, Let me bring in yes. Dr. Um, Ayogo is here into this. Now, when you talk about primary health care, the focus must also be on rural, in rural areas. So for ANPA, for instance, you're partnering with the Abia State Government. About 65 of you have come to Nigeria to provide you know, to, uh, medical assistance, especially to areas that are not, um, you know, not, not urban areas. What more contributions, especially from organizations like yours, um, what impact can you have and what areas should be addressed, especially for rural areas, to encourage them to check for screenings, for tests, for checks, and how much money are you bringing in as well to support the government's efforts? Thank you very much. Um, AMPA is going to be 30 years next year, and for every year of its um, existence, it has embarked on medical missions. And over the years, it distilled it being able to have a specific amount of time dedicated. That's called AMPA Week, during which we perform medical, surgical, dental, ophthalmologic interventions. Over time, it's gotten a little bit more complicated and a little bit more comprehensive because the needs of the on-ground um, population is so great. During the time, we collaborate with the needed um, stakeholders. Usually, the state government is the easiest um, partners with which you could uh, be able to um, identify and interface with the uh, local population that requires care. And it's really interesting, and it's so heartwarming that a lot of the diaspora physicians have in their heart to give back and come to these communities um, where they may or may not belong. Um, I'm not from Abia. A lot of the people that are coming aren't. And we choose uh, where we go in a complicated process anyway that uh, occurs over a year and um, bring back the equipment and the needed um, medications um, after having done an evaluation to see what gaps are there that need to be met. Healthcare delivery is a complicated process. I mean, it requires a lot of interdisciplinary collaboration. I think that um, in the rural areas have the highest need, and so they have the greatest impact because you have people who could never afford the quality of care that they're given. And indeed, the true north for healthcare would be for us to be able to provide population care at a reasonable cost with a great patient experience. And part of that experience includes us being able to perform capacity building where we have workshops to train the on-ground teams. This year, we're going to be training them on helping babies survive, which is prioritizing neonatal survival. As you can see, it's one of the top causes of mortality in our country currently. Also, advanced cardiac life support, where we'll be certifying 50 individuals and also having a sustainability process where champions can then train people after we're gone. And then also a, a workshop called Stop the Bleed, where, as Dr. Ngoba had mentioned, trauma is a significant cause of injury. And the commonest preventable cause of death is from hemorrhage. And so the Stop the Bleed training, which was championed by American College of Surgeons, allows us to use evidence-based 
principles to teach people how to place a tourniquet and stop bleeding and save a life, irrespective of whatever they could use as a makeshift tourniquet or a real one. This is very important for the organization. Um, the vision is a healthier Nigeria, a healthier world, and working with the different stakeholders on a federal, state, and local level allows us to be able to st extend our reach. And currently what we're trying to do is to develop more sustainability products projects on ground to be able to not just bring the bread, but show people how to make the bread so that the healthcare delivery is a constant continuum. Um, we are hoping that uh, Abia State is the beginning of us being able to do this in a more sustainable manner. And next year, when APA turns 30, we intend to do the same in Lagos. And we will bring our annual scientific national convention, which we normally have in June with the mission, to Lagos State to have a comprehensive mission and convention in 2025. All right, Debbie, thank you so much. You know, what you said was very apt. Things as some people will say it's as little as using the tunicate properly, or things as little as a hemlich maneuver that could save a life. People don't have skills like this. They don't even know it. And I'd like to go back to the primary healthcare sector. Correct me if I'm wrong. The primary healthcare sector looks dead to me. And I can say that for a fact because I've been doing a lot more research there lately. I am playing in that space. So I know it for a fact in some rural areas. It looks dead. I mean, how can we resuscitate it? You'll be amazed. Most local government hospitals that are supposed to be like the first line buffer have no infrastructure, have nothing they could use. And the private sector is even taking the place of the government primary health care sector. I mean, things as little in this, you know, local communities, local health care, primary health care. What can we do? What are your thoughts on this? Innovation, innovation, mm. innovation. Why do I say that? Well, COVID taught us a lot. I think in the years from COVID, we've kind of like had a trajectory of improvement that we never would have seen otherwise. It's impossible I, or it will be very difficult to staff rural areas with quality care professionals because just like you and I, they want to be where they feel they have the best quality of life by choice. Now, I think that there are opportunities in us being able to navigate that and there may be some dissension. Yes, exactly. Digital health. Mm -hmm. um, we're EMR. talking about asynchronous um, 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 visits. We're talking about synchronous visits. We're talking about using devices. You know, you can get a lot of information by having devices worn by individuals over a period of time and then collating the information. We're talking about um, phone visits. Um, there has to be an extrapolation of the care delivery outside of the face-to-face -face for there to be able to capture that. And I think people are willing and ready. Last year, we had a mission in Ota, and there was a young man, he had a thyroidectomy. And I remember when he was leaving, I was worried he wasn't understanding everything. So I went back to his room to talk to him about it, and his wife asked me, if she could record me, and she did. And two months later, I was in New York, and I got a text message, and it was their path. So that means she understood, she took the instruction, they did what was needed, and they followed up with the results. And I was like, I was like, this is progress. Yeah. You know, they may not understand English, and it may be hard for us to communicate, but we were effective in being able to solve that issue. So I think innovation is going to be the key okay, in being able so to much. unlock that thank dimension. So that. Innovation, yeah. funding, primary health care, getting all the aspects right. And then we have this opportunity in uh, Abia State, where the experts are going to uh, help to make a difference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayogu Iziri, I got it right this time. <laughs> and thank you, <laughs> Professor Gumba, for joining us.